hold on to those role models. There are many negative ones about education. You think, hey, I don't want to be like that. Save me from being that sort of doctor. But follow those models that you admire and acquire the qualities that they have. I hope that you will have such a person. But always think when you're looking after your patients, would, how would I like to be looked after? How would I like my brother to be looked after? How would I like my father to be looked after? If you do that, then you'll give your patients good care. This little exercise that we used to do. You might want to do it when you go home. Write a letter. And the letter comes from a patient. You've actually retired. Time has gone on, and you've grown older and wiser. Uh, you won't be richer, but you'll be older and wiser. <laughs> and the time has come for your retirement day. And the letters come in. And the presents, and the flowers, and the claps, and the speeches. You open one of the letters, and it says, Dear Doctor, thank you so much for looking after me. You gave me... You worked... And it names all the qualities of the doctor you always hoped you would be. And you read this letter and you think, yes, yes, I'm so pleased that I reached my goals as a doctor. All those qualities which I hoped I would develop, they've been recognised. This is a good exercise for you to do, not now because there's a time, but maybe at home. You write yourself this letter. Because in this letter will be the values which you will never be taught in the standard medical school of teaching, but nonetheless will make you a good doctor. Technical competence is certainly one of them, um, but it's not the only one. And I think some of you are already thinking, what sort of doctors do you want to be? But write it down, believe me, writing it makes a real difference to whether you achieve that or not. Writing your goals. So it may seem like a silly exercise. Can I ask you to do it some other time? Okay. Whoops. Now let's go on to the treatment side of the model. So the best treatment you can have is prevention. Every doctor should work to put themselves out of business so they don't have anything. No patients at all. You've successfully prevented all the disease. And I think in China in the old days, you were paid while the patients were well. If the patients got sick, you didn't get paid because you had failed. So can I encourage you to fail? Teachers don't usually say that. But I want you to be so effective at preventing disease that you never see any patients. And I hope you'll be very well rewarded by the state. But maybe not. So we've got a problem. Um, what are the risk factors? Who should we screen for prostate cancer? Well, it's going to be older people. Um, there's some ethnicity. Uh, so Afro-Caribbean patients in the UK uh, and in America, it's more common in Asian patients. There's certainly a genetic factor. Smoking, maybe. Exercise reducing the risk, mm, I'm not sure. How do you screen? In the literature I'll give you on the stick, on the program, there's some papers from uh, about screening and about recent advances in the management of prostate cancer. That's full text articles for you to look at. I think that people don't know. And I think that prostate, the use of prostate-specific antigen as a screening test, different countries do different things. There are problems with overdiagnosis, worrying the patient, frightening the patient with false positives. Um, we don't quite know how to use it. Uh, different countries do different things. Do you know what, this, what happens in Ukraine? So I think we don't know about screening, but it's most likely the screening will be targeted at patients, relatives, and greatest risk. So here's the patient. 
patient's father died of prostate cancer, the patient's uncle died of prostate cancer, the patient's nephew has prostate cancer, what about the patient's sons? I think they're at risk. They should be screened. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. Um, and they should be screened early, probably in their 40s. Um, and I think the programs for screening and identification of the genetic markers of people at risk is still developing. I think we still don't quite know this. And some studies are in progress in many countries on this one. But I would focus on these people, early screening. Population screening, whether every man over the age of 50 should be screened, I don't think we know the answer to this. But watch this space. So, prevention screening. Then, what about dealing with the pathology and the disorders of structure? What have we got? Well, three main prongs, three main knives, if you like. And I'm not going to say much about this. But if you want to know how a, a radical prostatectomy is done, get that little website up. And it's a little animated prostatectomy. It's very simple, but you know, little, little prop animated knives snip off the vast deferent, snip down here. So, <coughs> in terms of surgical principles, if at all possible, you want to remove the tumour completely. That will depend on the staging of the tumour. Whether it's, whether it's gone outside the prostatic capsule, what it's doing, whether it's operable or not. So the, op the options are surgery, uh, radiotherapy, this is brachytherapy, so these are little seeds of radioisotope, uh, which will irradiate a small volume of prostate. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually quite technical. And I don't know how many centres are offering brachytherapy at the moment. Uh, this is an alternative to external beam radiotherapy. And chemotherapy, uh, not chemotherapy, uh, hormone therapy. And this is usually based on the uh, inhibition of the secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone by LHRH analogues. And this is what this patient had, reducing the secretion of testosterone uh, by the testes, basically. There are a number of other drugs which work at various parts of the pathway. Some are experimental, some are in regular use. Uh, there are, there's a nice website you can visit which will tell you more about it. There's an article, which is a full text article, and that is in the handout, uh, the electronic handout that you can have. Okay, I don't want to go into all this because I'm not an expert. Um, uh, I'm sure there's a urologist or someone who knows more about it than I do. So the patient started on... The, you saw that the tumour had extended well outside the prostatic capsule. It was actually involving the bones and maybe other soft tissues. So clearly surgery was not an option. Radiotherapy to the prostate isn't going to achieve that much the, <coughs> because the problem is widespread. So systemic treatment is required, and the patient started on whoops. The patient started on an uh, LHRH uh, releasing hormone analog, um, and later went on to docetaxel, uh, which is a, an anti-cancer agent, a chemotherapeutic agent. So I'm, I'm going to go through all this. What I'm saying to you is that each level of disease expression there is a therapeutic intervention. Okay. Sexual dysfunction is quite common, not as a result of the cancer, but as a result of the treatments. Either as a result of the surgery, or as a result of the medical orchid, which the patient has zero testosterone levels, and so will likely become, uh, have sexual dysfunction. I didn't mention these two levels at which the disease shows itself. The level, of the level of disabilities and the level of social effects. Because the treatments the patients receive for their cancer will have effects on the patient's sexual function, sort of disability, and some effects on relationships. When I was a medical student, we didn't think about that. As far as we were concerned, this, is, this was the disease, this was the problem. You, we didn't think, think about that at all. 
But that's part of the patient's disease, part of the patient's problems. And you may need somebody else in the team to help you with those. If you're the generalist here, you are the conductor of the orchestra. That's the way it should work in my view. You are the conductor and you draw in the specialists. But you are the one who will have the closest relationship with the patient and you will want to make sure that all these other levels are being treated. Now we've gone through the levels of the seven level model, uh, both therapeutic and diagnostic. For the physical dimension, there's something I haven't told you. Patient's sweating. Patient's sweating. Patient has some signs, has a tremor, a tachycardia. What sort of disorder of function do you think this is? How do you explain this physiologically? Speak in a much louder way for me. Or deaf or blind is not this. Okay, something to do with sympathetic system dysfunction. Increase sympathetic activity. Okay. What do you think that is? Why might the patient have increased sympathetic tone? Hmm? You have to shout, really shout. I know you, are, you think you're not used to shouting, but do it for me. Maybe it's cortical cortisol level. The cortical cortisol. Cortisol. Okay, does that increase your sympathetic activity? If I gave you a shot of cortisol, would that increase your sympathetic tone? I mean, cortisol is a stress hormone, yes, but I don't think one causes the other. Maybe the patient's anxious. Maybe the patient's got an anxiety state. Is that possible? Why do you think they might have an anxiety state? Because they are concerned that they have cancer. Or they've been told they have cancer. Or they, they know that this is a bad symptom in Nigeria. Or they just have the diagnosis from the oncologist um, and they develop these symptoms. Any other reasons? Is it maybe the patient started on treatment? I'll give you a clue. The patient started on treatment. Side effect of the drugs is absolutely right. In at one stage in the United Kingdom, 10% of all admissions to hospital were caused by treatments unwanted effects of treatments. Whenever a patient